Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practices Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And I know what you're doing. Everyone's looking for an advantage to grow their practice. And there's one advantage you are not using in dentistry. And I'm going to give you that advantage from one of the worldwide experts and most popular people in all of dentistry, Dr. Mark Hyman. So you don't want to miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. We are so pumped to have you on. And even today, it's been an amazing day already. I have been trying to get this guy for a long time, but he's been ducking me. And I finally got him today. One of the most popular speakers in all of dentistry in the world of dentistry, Dr. Mark Hyman. Uh, and so you're going to love this. You're going to see this guy has got more energy than most people I've ever met. And uh, you're going to want to take notes. Now, one thing about the shows that we're doing, we are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you can see, there's a feed. And as questions come up, please ask your questions. We love the questions. And ask some tough ones because I got them on right now. And I'm going to feed them directly to them if you send them to me. Now, if you're watching this after the live feed, go ahead and ask the question anyway. And uh, I'll get Dr. Hyman to answer it. Uh, directly because we want you guys to get the most out of this. If you're going to spend time learning about dentistry and how to get better, I want I want your questions to get answered. And, and we love the question so much. I always say the question is the answer. I think it was Walter Haley that said that years ago. It was brilliant. Um, we give out a free Apple iWatch and two tickets to act activate every Monday. So we're going to be doing that later today to the best question asked. So go ahead and ask them. So before I introduce this guy, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because as a speaker, one of the things that I've done is I've been out and about and dentistry. And I remember there was a conference I went to about 10 years ago. And it was one of those, I just sat down at the table by myself and over comes Mark. And I thought, I like this guy. And he's almost been like a, a big brother of mine, always checking in on me, seeing how I'm doing. And uh, I just, I'm so grateful for our relationship, Mark. And you have had an incredible career in dentistry. And now you're in the midst of a transition that I want you to talk about. But if somebody hasn't heard of Dr. Mark Hyman, which isn't possible, um, who is Dr. Mark Hyman? Who are you? Or what a frightening question, but thank you for having me. I'm honored. I know you're having just the best of the best of dentistry on this amazing show. And uh, since you had all of them, now you have me and I'm flattered. You know, I'm just a guy fixing teeth uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. I was born in Greensboro, went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I am a Tar Heel, applied to one college, um, got into dental school at UNC. I finished dental school in three and a half years. Uh, which I always love talking about because people say, oh, you were this superstar. Uh, not quite. Uh, actually, the first week back of spring semester, first year of dental school, I quit school. Really? I was such a loser and couldn't do it and knew I would never be a dentist. And when told the dean I was going to quit, and he said, great, going back to class, come back at halftime, we'll sign you out. And I went slinking down the hall of the UNC School of Dentistry and ran into a young professor, Dr. Ron Strauss, who saved my life. He said, Mark, being a dental student is nothing like being a dentist. Just give it another hour, give it a day, see how you do. And I had a decent, decent morning, went back to the dean, told him I wasn't going to quit, and he acted disappointed. Mm. Pieces. But I uh, muddled my way through the rest of the semester, started in clinic, my patients loved me, and I graduated dental school in three and a half years. So I graduated December 1983, went over to Israel and worked as a volunteer dentist for four months grew a beard, grew my hair long, uh, played basketball with the soldiers every afternoon. It was unbelievable. And my last week there, I met my wife. So a pretty profitable trip. Uh, Absolutely. We met in April, got engaged in September, married the following February. So we've been married 32 years. Wow. Which, as you will attest to, I'd like to describe as 10 of the happiest years of my life, right? <laughs> but, uh, this isn't live. Right? Yeah, it is. And it is live. Dang. And then I did a two-year hospital residency in UNC Hospital in oral medicine, hospital dentistry, uh, complex prosthodontics, oral surgery, sedation, maxillofacial, um, 
just pediatric dentistry, every specialty in dentistry just about. And then I bought basically a 10-year-old stalled practice in Greensboro, North Carolina, started July 1st, 86, and just made every mistake in the book. Mm -hmm. And the receptionist quit six weeks after I started. The hygienist was chain smoker. I fired her and I had one employee left. Don't you just love it when that happens? That's what we call the smooth transition, right? Pretty cool. And then uh, God smiled upon me because I went to a Linda Miles seminar my third month of private practice and heard Linda speak. And I went up to her like Oliver Twist in some Dickinsonian novel, right? Please, sir, may I have some more? I said, Linda, I bought this practice. I don't know what I'm doing. She said, poor child, let's have lunch. And she listened to me whine and moan and complain and said, why don't you do this, that, this, that, give me five little ideas. Next month, the practice doubled and then doubled and doubled. Then I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Kathy Jameson, Dr. John Jameson, and they came very important, dear friends of mine and important parts of my life. And that's something that I so appreciate about dentistry, um, the abundance and positive nature of the men and women who do the speaking and teaching and consulting. There's little bits of silliness going on. For the most part, there's a couple of turkeys, but they're really the men and women who speak are very positive, forward thinking and of abundance. And there's enough work for everybody. So I love being around positive people. I remember meeting you, Kurt, and just going, this guy's dangerous. He is uh, the most passionate, enthusiastic, positive spirit I'd ever met. And I'm just honored that we become friends and I have a ton of respect for you, bud. And so this is a joy to be here. So my private practice, as I said, I started, I had uh, no hygienist. And I had a woman, Cheryl, who said she'd give me a couple weeks. She stayed 14 and a half years. The assistant that I didn't fire stayed with me eight and a half years. The reception I hired stayed four years till she moved back to California with a new baby. Uh, my office administrator, Mary Catherine, has been with me 25 years. My lead dental assistant, now our treatment coordinator, Ms. Tina Calloway, has been with me 18 years. So for the young docs listening to that, that's one of the greatest privileges of my career is when you have people that become part of your family and uh, they know you so well. And you spend more time with the team than you do with your significant others mm-hmm. and children. So this is it's just imperative that you hire people that are smarter than you and get out of their way. That's yeah. That's the way I can say it. So my practice went from really a very modest, essentially bankrupt practice to the top 1% by following the winners of dentistry. By the time that I've spent inside a dentistry, Kurt, I think the most impactful thing I did was my time spent at the Panky Institute. And my time at Spear Education has been huge. You've got Dawson, you've got Coyce, the winners of dentistry. Everybody can learn from somebody like that. Yeah. And time has just been invaluable. And outside of dentistry, when I, my time I spent with the Dale Carnegie organization, I hope everybody listening has read How to Win Friends and Influence People and, uh, and has taken time to take a Carnegie class. It's one of the most unbelievably impactful things every man and woman I've ever met could do. So every one of my team has taken some level of Carnegie training, and we still have a Carnegie trainer that comes in every summer to do a two-hour update. Mr. Nigel Alston from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Kurt, I'd love for you to have Nigel on. Yeah. A mesmerizing communicator and a passionate champion for positive thinking and a life well-lived. So um, I'm very humbled by your nice words and your friendship and respect. But like I said, I'm just a guy fixing teeth. I love it when people in my audience say, well, man, this is all great, but I'm not in Beverly Hills or Palm Beach or Palm Springs. And I'm like, your mama, I'm in freaking Greensboro, North Carolina, where our three biggest employers were furniture, textiles, and tobacco. Mm-hmm. How are those industries doing? They got slaughtered. Right. Uh, every year our practice has grown, and I'm just really humbled for the women that I work for and, uh, and for the doctors that have put so much into me and the teammates and the consultants and coaches that have given me a lot of love and respect and attention and affection. So thus here I am. Yeah. It's awesome that you say that too, because you and I share the same thought process. I think as a dentist, either young or mature, it's too hard to figure this out by yourself. And you said the Panky Institute and all of the other great institutions. What was the, what was the, what was the catalyst? What was the motivation? So, cause I like to think of it as a young dentist watching this saying, you know, Dr. Hyman, that's great for you, but I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I got little kids. What was the, what was the reason you went? 
Right. I was doing more single tube dentistry than anybody in the state of North Carolina. I could get anybody to let me do a filling on them. Mm -hmm. There was nothing comprehensive about that. There was I didn't really understand and respect the relationship aspect of practices. In dental school, there's no benefit for being a good guy, for being a good communicator. It's all you cut this prep correct or you fail. Mm -hmm. If you do no matter that the decay went in there, it's worth than telling worse than telling you to go to hell. It's go to endo. <laughs> oh, gosh. And uh, just amazing to me. And um, I really hated dental school. I resented how I was taught. And uh, one of my mentors in Greensboro was a sensational dentist, now retired, Dr. Reed Clark, was going to go down to Panky. So uh, January 1990, my son was two months old. I went to Panky with Dr. Reed Clark and Dr. Gene Grubb, two of the premier restorative dentists in our community. And uh, I went to Panky every January for six Januaries until I went through the process. And then Dr. Irwin Becker called me into his office and offered me an opportunity to teach at Panky. And that was one of those trembling moments of my life. I was glad I had my depends on. Yeah. That was that, pretty That's very cool. And it, it just, so from that, I quit doing single tooth dentistry. And it taught me to get to know my patients better and to slow down and um, to figure out really the basis of our talk today, which is the number one thing that I feel that I've been able to do and I try to teach in my audiences is trying to teach folks how to outlisten the competition. Yeah, I love this topic so much because there's so many seminars on, you know, how to present, how to impress, how to, and this is the, the lost art of listening. No one really talks about it. So describe what that means in your practice when you say out listen the competition. Yeah, the, the fact is, it's unbelievable to me how bright and talented the men and women in dentistry are and how lousy they are at basic human relation principles. So one thing, when a new patient comes to see us, it's really important to me to know, well, how'd you find out about us? Who can we thank for referring you? And because uh, you sure want to reinforce that. So when somebody contacts us, our business team has a telephone answering slip with about 20 questions where they'll start to figure out the hot buttons and the preheats and why did they choose us? By a matter of philosophy, Kurt, I don't sign up for any HMO, PPO, managed care, any restricted plans. It compromises the quality of care I can offer my patients. I'm just not going to do it. Right. So when people come in, we kind of have an idea why are they here. Oftentimes, I'll walk out in the reception room to meet them myself, and that has been unbelievable because I don't know many doctors that do that. I've never seen a physician do it. And I walk out and shake their hand instead of saying, I'm Dr. Hyman. I say, hey, I'm Mark. Welcome home. Mm -hmm. We're going to take care of you. And right there, they're almost eaten out of my hand. We walk back to our consultation room, my treatment coordinator team and myself and the new patient, and we'll sit and I'll go through kind of the who, what, when, where, why questions where I try to keep asking questions. Tell me more. How do you mean? How does this make you feel? Really, what did your last dentist tell you about this? Heard a question that I am stunned that people in dentistry don't ask. When I ask my audiences for a show of hands, about one person out of 500 raises their hands. I'll say, how did you ask your patients, why did you leave your last dentist? Yeah. And I'm on the floor flabbergasted because people say, I, I don't ask. I'm like, Someone in our town just got fired. Don't you want to know why? Right. Do you think that's a key question? Yeah, absolutely. Getting smart with you, but why did you leave your last dentist? And often they'll say, well, he was always pushing crowns. Mm -hmm. I love hearing, because then I'll turn that around and say, well, ma'am, can I ask you a question? Do you think you need one? Mm -hmm. Almost always they'll say, I don't know. And I'll say, ma'am, did you ever see your teeth up on a monitor? Did you ever see your teeth on TV? Nope. And then I'll say, if I see changes going on in your mouth, do I have your permission to tell you? Right. And as soon as they say yes, it's supper time. It's just yeah. a good time to be a dentist. Yeah. So yeah. It's unbelievable, Kurt. My, my exit question when I finish going through all these who, what, when, where, why's, I'll say, ma'am, did you ever have a dentist start a visit like this? And 100% of the time, Kurt, they'll look me in the eye and say, I have never had a doctor sit down and talk to me like this. So the patient just said yes to me, and I haven't even examined him. Right. That, that's my hope and my, mes my message and my prayer for our young colleagues and our matures that are listening to this today. 
the men and women that outlist in the competition will thrive during turbulent times, I promise you, because no one else is doing it. Right. And so I just keep saying, tell me more. How do you mean? How does that make you feel? Really? You know, I'm not doing anything if the insurance doesn't pay for it. I'll say, really? Tell me more. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you about that, Mark, because this is such an important piece to a relationship-based practice or any relationship period is the ability to ask really, really good questions. Now, if you're a listener and you're watching this, Mark's asking what are called open-ended questions. They're not yes or no. Now, you and I are versed in this. We've taught this forever, but this is a very important piece you have to learn as a dentist. What's the difference between an open-ended and closed-ended question? I mean, a closed-ended question, you know, you need a crown because I said so, or do you have, that's, I hate asking the, the yes or no's. I want the choice of two yeses. I want the positiveness. I want the abundance. I want them to tell me that they want this. You know, Brother Bill Blatchford helped bring the concept of dentistry that nobody needs anything. Right. My seminar, I think need is a punitive four letter word. I don't want to ever hear the audience say it. The better four letter word, Kurt, is. Want. That. It's what do you want? Mm -hmm. it's, your, it's your health. Patients say, well, just go ahead and pull it. I'm like, really? Yeah. Do you want a permanent body part? Yeah. And so I just kind of keep saying, we, we have oral diarrhea in dentistry. We can't wait to tell the patient all of the science and engineering that we learned in dental school to get the A. Let me explain to you the stress strain curves of amalgam. Let me tell you about megapascals of the cement. Really? Yeah. Talking to a ceramic engineer, cool, but you're talking to me, you're wasting my time. Right. Uh, so that's the big thing to me, the old hot button. What, what's the reason they're going to say yes? And you keep asking questions till you get to it. So essentially, beyond someone having a fractured mandible or a fulminate abscess, nobody really needs what we're doing. Right. That's a concept that is nauseating to us. You know, that I first heard Bill Blashford say that I wanted to storm the podium and beat him up, but you kind of go, <laughs> we're basically in an elective cosmetic choice profession, so why not let somebody tell us exactly what they want for their health? Absolutely, yeah. It, and I, It takes time. You can't do that, in my mind, in the chair, when they've got a bib on with the operatory light in their face, with them leaning down and you standing over them. That's not a fair fight. That's not a win communicated situation. So the winners that I know of in dentistry, the Panky Dawson, Coyce, Spear, the Mike Schusters, the Kirk Barrents, the Kathy and John Jamesons, they, they, I think we all preach the same message. Yeah. You don't treat a stranger, you're in a relationship and um, you help people find a comfortable way to get what they want. Yeah. Absolutely. I found this to be true in most every great restorative dentist, the highest producers, they ask the best questions. They're just very, you know, questions, you know, what Mark's talking about here is crazy important because I heard Bill Blatchford say that 10 years ago too, the difference between want and need. People hate paying for things they need. They do. I hate every dime I spend on anything I need. I'll fight you. I will find a coupon. I'll find something cheaper. But when it comes to something I want, it's, there's no there's no budget. I want it. I'm going to get it. And so most dentists watching this would say, I totally understand that, but how do we get to the want? And it's exactly, it's the power of the question. When you can create really good open-ended questions and use them authentically like you are, it creates intimacy and understanding. Now, I'm not talking about physical intimacy. I'm talking about emotional intimacy. Now, this isn't just the dentist. You and Tina, I mean, I've watched Tina and the rest of your team. They're brilliant. I mean, it's, it's truly one of uh, there's no accident why you're su successful. You can see they're all trained to ask questions. Is that correct? Very much so. And um, the beauty of having a treatment coordinator with a new patient is the treatment coordinator, often a woman, they hear and see things that male docs don't right. and see body language and fidgeting and they see nodding or shaking their head or exasperation or panic or questions a lot of times I think you and I prove it when we speak, Kirk. We talk and talk and talk and talk. And we don't stop to let people think. We don't have quiet time to let things marinate. And uh, it's and it's all okay. But um, 
you know, it's hard. We, we in dentistry, in a restorative practice, some of these decisions that people are being asked to make make are twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar decisions. Right. How many of us listening today have made a twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar purchase in thirty seconds? Handful of us. It's most unusual. And silence doesn't mean no. It means that they're processing and trying to find a way. Right. So that's a good thing. So again, creating a safe space where it's uninterrupted, where you can have the listen, the relationship time, the questioning, the marinating time. It's important. I've had people get in my face hurt and say, well, that's not how I do it, but I want to have a practice like yours. And then my answer is when you can't have it, if you don't have the relationship time. Right. You know, yeah. This is from Dale Carnegie. They said, we buy from people we know, like, and trust. Yeah. Buy from people we know, like, and trust. That doesn't happen. When you walk in, why are you here? Because you're on my HMO plan. Right. I have a thousand dollars maximum. Now present optimal care dentistry. Really, you know, you put some big roadblocks ahead of me. Yeah. So that it takes time to say, is the restriction of the insurance is that going to dictate how fast we care for you, how fast you get what you want for your health? You tell me. Right. So, you know, our physician colleagues have seated their professional control to the insurance companies, and it's sad. They're no longer doctors in a relationship with their patients. They're providers of a commodity. Right. And that's sad, and I, I, I weep for them, but we can still we can still fight in dentistry. We can still overcome this. Oh, and yeah. the cool thing for the young superstars that we have, like you, Kurt, and Carrie Weber, and Uchi Odiahu, there's just stars in dentistry. I so love looking behind me where I've looked ahead of me to the Panky Dawson Coy Spear and I look behind and see your generation of inspiration. It's just really cool and uh, dentistry is in good hands. Well, that's very kind of you to say, buddy. And uh, I would I would also add, you know, we've had a we've had a good run with great mentors and you know I used to hear the word preceptorship all the time. We don't hear it as much anymore. But people that cared about other success coming behind. But you would see this, Mark, and I think you would agree. Your ability or how far or how successful you get in dentistry depends on how much you develop yourself and your team. And so that's that's what you're talking about. You're not talking about a magic question here. You're talking about really developing the entire team as great listeners. You use the word space. I love that. Not only in conversation, but also within the practice. And you were talking about the preclinical and new patient process because you transformed that when you went to the institute, thank you, institute came back. How do you use the preclinical, the treatment coordination in the consult room early in the process? Are you doing, you know, you talked about the early question, but how much of that happens and how important is that to the rest of the process? Right. Well, for me, so every new patient, every emergency patient sits down in our consult room with me and the treatment coordinator or our new or Dr. Steve Hatcher and the treatment coordinator. Because we, that's a differentiating, distinguishing, transformational part of the practice. And uh, once we finished going through the questions, then I turn the patient over to the treatment corner and say, it's going to get you started. And we'll take quality digital photos, full face, retracted. We take a Panorex and a full series at every new patient visit. Kurt, I'm, I'm embarrassed by our profession that we don't take a full series on every new patient that needs one, that it's time. And I'm going to ask why. It's because of the insurance company mm -hmm. right? And, and a full series. So to me, you charge a fair radiology fee. When we're digital, we use the CareStream sensors. They're awesome. You take what you need to take and you charge a fair radiology fee and break it up according to the insurance. It's not playing a game. To me, we charge for a pan and s vertical bite wings right, right off the rest because it didn't really cost you anything. They're digital. It's really not the insurance company's business to me that you took six other shots that you didn't charge for. It's just none of their business. Mm -hmm. So you do what you got to do. Then we take, we go chair side, we do the examination, we review the medical dental history, we do the full mouth charting, full mouth periodontal probing. Then we whip out our DigiDoc, our intraoral camera. Mm -hmm. I'm not the cameras, Kurt. DigiDoc is the number one rated camera by Reality Magazine. I have bought four versions of that camera. It's an American company, Dave and Brett Wilson out of California. They're unbelievable. 
for less than five grand, you have a 35 millimeter quality photo that you can put in front of your patient. So we have eight operatory. So we have eight, eight. cameras. And yeah, but Mark, Mark, I don't have any money for a, for a camera that size. What answer that one? You know, you should hock your mother to get a camera like that because <laughs> in a week it'll pay for itself. You can get it from the pawn shop. It, you know what? It's not real money. It's mm -hmm. uh, before your Visa card comes due, it pays for itself. To me, it's a physical impossibility to have an intro camera, to have your DigiDoc, and take a picture on every patient mm -hmm. and not add $500 a day. Yeah. Most people work 200 days a year, $500 added per day times 200. It's a $100,000 change in 12 months. Bam. Right. Just like that. Yeah. You can't, I mean, you can't do it. This is every doctor and teammate that's listening to this. This is your chance to buy Google stock at two. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Because you just promised me that you buy it, you use it for less than five grand, you'll go up a hundred thousand dollars in twelve months. You can't tell me there's anything else in your life in our world that you can get that return on investment, that ROI. You just right. can't do it. Right. Um, and can I ask you a question too? Okay. Uh now, in the one advantage that we're talking about, which is out listening, you do require your team to use those cameras quite a bit. Almost, is it every visit? How many photos are they taking? And then what, because they're coupling them, not with the photos, they're asking questions as they show the patients the photos. Give us some insight on that. Love that. Appreciate that. You know, DigiDoc trains everybody on how to take 12 pictures in two minutes. Okay. That's two minutes. You can't, can't tell me you can't take a before and after of a big hunk of tartar on the lower anterior teeth. Right. But I to the doctors, to their hygienists, it's just lovingly tell the hygienist, after you take one picture, I'll come check you. Mm -hmm. Why is that eight o'clock hygiene patient can sit for eight hours getting scaled till they pulp the teeth with the cavitron. Right. But it's inexcusable to not have a before and after picture because it's just a cleaning. Why do you want me to come back in three months? Why did my last dentist tell me this? Will the insurance pay for it? You must need a new car. Then it turns into, oh, I was infected. Now mm -hmm. I got it. The before, the during photo of every procedure and the after is imperative. Right. The photo is what I want our treatment coordinators, business team members to send with the insurance claim. One of those big MODFL, TWA, KLM amalgams, a little bit of enamel sticking out. You take out the alloy and take a during photo of that. People say to me, Dr. Mark, I'll use my digital camera. You can take your gloves off, wash your hands take a series of photos with your digital camera, set the camera down, rewash your hands, put gloves back on. No, you're not. You're just not doing it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, for practices that choose to see people chair side for an emergency, I think before anything is said, you take a photo. Take a photo of a good tooth and say, here's healthy enamel, way to go. And take a picture of a broken body part and then don't even speak. Mm -hmm. well, and I counsel my audiences and those I've had the privilege of teaching just to use the greatest dental word ever, which is wow. Wow. Make the so, nasty face you can and just go. <sighs> so what? Do, how do you use it? When you're putting up a photo, you'll just say, wow. And then do you look at the patient? What are you doing? Make the nastiest face you can and just go. Mm. 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 You know, in a business negotiation, the first one to speak loses. Loses. So you put the picture up there, and the patient says, "My tooth is cracked. You need to fix it." Mm -hmm. Next thing that you say is, "Let's get a pre-denial from Aetna Insurance. I'm going to shoot you." Mm -hmm. Right. Because you know, we don't file for any pre-denials. I've heard mm -hmm. I've heard you a number of times. I don't recall you speaking about that, but uh, we very strongly try to talk to our people who observe in our office, to our teammates, to my audiences that I have the privilege of speaking to, say if someone asks for a pre-denial, it means that you, we, I, the dental family, haven't created that sense of urgency to act. Dr. Kathy Jameson said those eight words to me, Kurt, mm -hmm. years ago, how do you create the sense of urgency mm -hmm. and change your dental career? And the answer is you put a picture in front of everybody and you stop talking. Right, right. And they may say, do I need a crown? You may say, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Do you want a slow, painful root canal? Oh, God, I don't want one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the tooth and say, see the enamel, it's smooth, it's solid, it's white, way to go. Yep. 
here's the biting surface. Uh, man, you know, the tooth split. How can I help you? Yeah. Now I want you to pause right there because if you're watching this, you've already seen how Mark communicates and obviously he's an expert communicator and I just got a Chris Ramsey's made a comment. Mark, Matt Snipes said Mark Hyman is legit. Saw him at Sarek 25, truly inspiring dentist. And we got our good friend Sandy Pardue on saying, wow, I love it. Now I, I think Sandy and, and Kathy James, all of them would agree, you know, what you're doing when you become a master communicator, one of the things I've noticed already in our short time just on this episode is you're answering a question with a question. Why is that is why is that so important? And what do other dentists need to learn in that journey cuz you've you know, you've had a very fruitful journey. Why is that so important? Right. To me, if you're answering a question with an answer, you're back to being a dental student trying to get an A. Right. You're not hitting people in their heart and in their brain where their decision making is done. Mm. It's just so easy to answer no matter what they say to say, tell me more. How do you mean? How would you like me to help you? And just keep saying, explain that to me. You'll be amazed what happens. Right. And like you say, Kurt, no one wants to pay for a crown. They don't want to lose their tooth. They don't want to lose a body part. They don't want a root canal. They don't want crown lengthening. They don't want the tooth to split the rest of the way and have it extracted, bone grafted, then an implant, custom abutment, and an implant crown. So I was speaking, I had the privilege of speaking for a fabulous group in Muskegon, Michigan, mm -hmm. this past Friday. Uh, amazing, fabulous young dentist there, Dr. Michelle Van Dyke. It's her 10th anniversary, one of the most successful dentists in the state of Michigan. And they had me as a present to the team and to the community had about a hundred some people there was a delight and um just um but unbelievable to me what what can happen with the power of the picture and the power of listening and that, that that's that's my hope and prayer for people that they will do that that everybody will take a picture of every patient and recognize that so in the audience somebody said for a crown i said how much in your practice and they said it's twelve hundred dollars i said no it's not they looked at me I said, that's $100 a month for a year. That's $25 a week for a year. That's $3 a day. It's a couple Starbucks a day for a year to keep a body part. Is that worth it? Mm -hmm. You can look you and I in the eye and say, no, that's not worth it. And with my love and respect, it is okay. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell me that somebody, virtually everybody can't find $3 a day for something that they really value and want and choose for their health. Yeah. Because if yeah. it only lasts a year, that's three dollars a day. If it lasts three years, you paid a dollar a day to keep a body part. Are you kidding me? It's a pack of gum. Right. If it lasts ten years, you can just break it down. So I try to encourage the audience when it comes time to talk in finances is to break it into small pieces. My blessed dad, Jer, who passed away three years ago, I still miss him. But Pop used to say you could lift an elephant if you just cut it in small pieces. Yeah. Right. So cut the elephant into small pieces. Cut that, oh my God, asking for the sale, asking for the commitment. You cut it into a small part. For me, I would say to you, Kirk, it's important that you keep this tooth the rest of your life. Absolutely. So if it is, how would you feel about investing about $3 a day for a year to keep it? Piece of cake. Is that comfortable for you? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. They say, well, make $3 a day. You know, that's, an, that's a good question. Yeah, it's not the way we do it, but it's uh, yeah. we make it too hard, and I think the men and women of dentistry are just dying for the right piece of equipment or the right CE course, so they don't have to confront. Yeah, but why is it a confrontation? What a joy to give people what they want. So, part of the confidence I got from Panky and Spear and Dawson and Poise and Dale Carnegie. Kathy Jamison and Linda Miles and Naomi Rohde and Kurt Barrett, the superstars of dentistry, it is abundance and a positive spirit and a loving, trusting spirit. And it's just a real fun way to practice. Yeah. Not having the conversation and not being insurance dependent. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, and I'm, I'm of the same opinion as you. I mean, there's so much blue sky out there. We really don't have any competition. I asked you before the show starts, how much competition do we really have in dentistry? And 
really don't have any. I mean, if they're if and you think about, I think about this for my own. So if I did half the things I know I should do, well, you know, there's it lends itself to a whole another wonderful result. Now, the question part, I want to just ask you a few more things. I want to ask you about how you use questions a little bit more. You use the phrase "tell me more," and there's been so many great instructors that you and I share mutually. If you're a young dentist and you're like, I don't even know where to start, I would say start with that. Tell me more because patients are going to tell you a lot of things. And the second thing I want to ask you about is if somebody doesn't line up where our core values don't, ma- you use the word lovingly. You just kind of send them on their way. But over time, what you do is you create a practice of people that have the same value system as you, but you slowed down enough to listen to what was important to them. So um, what other simple tools would you give a dentist that's maybe never been good at questions before our team? Right. The sequencing of the question, I've done role-playing. I had the privilege of speaking at Hinman in March, and we did role-playing with some young docs, and it was just stunning to me, I'm sure, how bright and talented they were, and they just couldn't seem to figure out how to start a conversation, and maybe it's because they've spent their entire life with this thing in front of them. Right. Their iPhone. But um, So I said, why don't you first say to somebody, did you have any trouble finding your way here? Now, I'm new to town. Oh, that can lead you to a conversation. Or Google Maps, I came right here. Cool. And then I will say, is it important that you keep your teeth the rest of your life? What are your goals for your teeth, your health, your smile? Tell me, why, you know, why are you here? Why did you leave your last dentist? Mm-hmm. And just keep asking those questions. You know, tell me, tell me about going to your last dentist. I love my last dentist. Tell me why. He never found anything. Cool. So that's where you say, well, ma'am, if I see changes going on in your mouth, do I have your permission to tell you? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you how many times it's happened where a patient said, well, just examine me with one eye. Don't look so close. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Yeah, we can do that. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's, you know, again, it just means, again, that we, you, I, the family haven't created that sense of urgency, the sense that it's important to do something, that it's important to act and that is the beauty of whipping out your digidoc and taking pictures on people and let the picture do the, the buying, the selling, the treatment planning, the case acceptance, the urgency, creating the sizzle and the wow, however you want to describe it. Right. People got in my face, Kurt, and say, well, I'm not a salesman. Mm-hmm. I'm like, your mama, you don't sell. We all sell. Mm-hmm. And if you have kids trying to get a kid to go to bed at bedtime, you think you're not selling? Of course you are. Oh, yeah. Again, so just the questions and the confidence to listen and know that you don't have to have the answer right away, that you can say, let me think about it. That's a good question. Now, the fact is there's 300 million some Americans and half of them don't even go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. So my dear friend, Dr. Keith Phillips, who was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, he's at the VA hospital now in Kernersville, North Carolina. Keith is a star. He is. And I speak and doesn't anymore. That's dentistry. He's lost nationwide. And Keith has a wonderful expression is that your patient is always right. Mm. Don't have to be your patient. Right. You like can choose. You say what you need is not what I do. You are absolutely right. You just don't have to be your patient. It's okay to say it's okay to grow elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So, now, part of this is the ability or the confidence just not to be attached to an outcome. Now, you know, we coach a lot of young dentists too, and I think a lot of times they're listening with an agenda. You know, they'll ask a question and they're waiting for the patient to say what, you know, I think an important part is just get good at the questions first. And then really, you know, even in casual conversation, you're pretty quick, but I can tell you're listening. You're listening to the response and you're responding. Covey said it a long time ago. The problem is that we listen to respond, not really to understand. And you learn so much when you truly authentically listen to understand, because that's what we're talking about here. The question is one piece, but how important is the question or is the answer or the listening part and listening to understand? Yeah, that's, uh, I got to meet Dr. Covey, got my picture taken with him. I took a Covey class in 1989, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely so true. Kurt, you mentioned an agenda. One of the great gifts to me is being fiscally responsible for your family and your practice and yourself so that you can practice debt free. Our young listeners are two, three, five hundred grand in debt. It's easy for them to look at you and I and go, there's just no way. 
Well, I just showed everybody listening today how they can spend five thousand dollars to add a hundred thousand dollars a year for the next five years easily not even trying 500 bucks a day the mm-hmm. fact is a thousand dollars for a crown and you have one crown a day that's 200 grand in 12 months there's not a single person listening today they can't do that you whip out your digi doc take a picture on every patient it, to me it's a scientific and physical possibility not mm-hmm. at care and that's not selling it's not over treating and showing people broken body parts that they just can't see and they don't own the problem yet. So what a glorious thing to do is to let go of these limiting beliefs and have the patient say yes. Mm-hmm. One of the great gifts for me early in my career, Kurt, I heard Mr. Greg Stanley from Whitehall Management. Back in 1986, I was the youngest kid in the room and uh, he talked about living within your means and paying off your debts. And so patients know when your agenda is, I need a Porsche payment, I need to pay for my beach house, my mountain house. You know, my wife and I were congruent financially, physically, and um, we bought our practice in 1986 and paid it off January 1989. So that's a real liberating thing to be able to practice debt-free. After 19 years of private practice in 2005, I got fired, which I love to say my former partner and I, who I love, um, we agreed not to work together, so I had to move to a new facility in 2005. And um, not a big deal, just borrow a million dollars and get rocking plus. And uh, that got paid off in less than five years. And mm-hmm. we came back to abundance, fully funding your 401k and spoiling your teammates and, and uh, giving heavily to your church and synagogue or mosque or wherever you choose to value. I hope everybody listening someday will get back to their dental school. I'm real active at the UNC School of Dentistry. Mm-hmm. I would have been the person least likely to ever give a nickel to the UNC School of Dentistry in 19... 19- yeah. ...fundraising committee, and my wife and I endowed a scholarship for Dr. Ron Strauss there, the man who kept me from quitting school, and uh, we're about to do more, so... That's pretty awesome. Yeah, Barry Polanski just said, say, hey, Tar Heel, old school communicator. Love Barry Polanski. What a brilliant mind. Um, Barry's book about the new patient experience Mm -hmm. is priceless. Any dentist, it's the Bible for young dentists to walk people through a new patient experience and and stick your fundamentals so that you've got all your information to make a complete diagnosis. And then with the patient's permission, you can offer them complete, comprehensive, exquisite dentistry. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the great gifts that Jameson Management will teach, and I know you have this message too, Kurt, once you present in care, is giving the patient permission to say you can do some of it, all of it, none of it. Mm-hmm. We love to talk about there's no hostages in our practice. You don't have to be here. Right. You don't have to say anything I'm suggesting. I'm trying to give you exactly what you said you wanted for your health. Is that okay? Yeah. Comfortable. You know, the idea of comfortable financials, care credit is the... 800 pound gorilla in dentistry and they have been extraordinarily supportive of my career, of my speaking career, um, and the privilege of recording an audio CD for care credit, creating the dream team with a winning attitude in 2006. And it's one of their top giveaways because it's worth twice what they pay for it, right? Right, 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 right. You know, a couple years ago, care credit, we put over $400,000 on care credit in one year. And at a seminar, Kurt, I had somebody get in my face and say that that means you lost forty thousand dollars. You only got paid three hundred sixty thousand. I'm like, no, honey. It means I got to do three hundred, paid three hundred sixty thousand. I could have walked out the door. I am pleased to take a small haircut to be able to take great care of people. So that's just easy to me. That's not that hard. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to ask you about this, too. If I'm a young dentist watching this and I fundamentally agree, you say, Mark, you know what? You're right. I would love to do this, but I can't get my team to understand this. Or, I mean, where would you start? Because you you have a great seminar called, you know, the Top Gun team. All that, and you've, you've had a, an excellent team. How did you get your team involved in this competitive advantage of listening? Yeah, I love the way you phrase that. If, if the team's not on board, you're killing yourself. Right. And part of this is hiring people smarter than you and training them well and get at, getting out of their way. Mm-hmm. I've been a CERAC user for 20 years, and my team does all the design. I'll ask in my seminars, how many of you 
have the t- dental assistant do the design and no one raises their hand. I'm like, you're on drugs. You got these magnificent women who are young and brilliant on computers. Prep the tooth and get out of their way and go prep another one. Right. Why do you sit there and play with a hundred thousand dollar etch a sketch machine? Just get out of their way. That just that's crazy to me. Um, it's imperative to me that you train the team. Um, as a matter of philosophy, Kurt, I will pay for any continuing education course that one of my teammates wants to take inside or outside of dentistry. There's a self improvement thing at the church. People going through Dale Carnegie. Um, you know, we we're a learning, growing organization. We read books together as a team. That's awesome. So uh, probably, yeah, we're in the middle of reading um, one of Maxwell's leadership books right now as a team. Yeah. Everybody on the team has read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Millionaire Next Door, Good to Great by Collins, Who Moved My Cheese. You know, it's you have an opportunity as a doctor to enhance these people's lives in the practice and when they go home. Right. So they have happier home lives and they come back to work happier. How silly is that? Right. You know, um, and, and most of them argue, well, there's there's a fundamental shift in thinking what you're talking about, Mark, is when you look at your team members as not a cost or a, um, you know, money going out, it's an investment. Not only their um, compensation, that's an investment because if I'm going to give you money to work here, I'm going to expect a return. Also, never begrudge the money that you invest on your own personal education as well as your teams because you're always going to get that back tenfold. So you you give your team, you let them know, hey, look, you want to get better. I'll pay for any course. You, you tell them that when they when they came on board in your team? Yeah. I mean, that that's, and we go to a lot of courses together. Mm-hmm. You know, starting in 1986, I set a goal to go to a hundred hours a year of continuing education because that's the smartest people I met in dentistry. Right. They have FAGD, their fellowship at the Academy of Gen- Dentistry. I was one of two people in Greensboro that had my mastership for the Academy of General Dentistry. Mm-hmm. A bunch of those courses I didn't want to take, Kurt, but right. it made me better dentist. It gave me judgment. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Like I said, I was going to courses with the, the superstar dentists in my community. Uh, it was just kind of interesting. As I said, Dr. Reed Clark was a tremendous impact on me. Dr. Gene Grubb was a superstar. And my new, now my new partner, Dr. Steve Hatcher, bought Dr. Gene Grubb's practice. So bringing him in, I didn't have to explain to this young man why it was important to go to Panky. He'd already been to Panky mm-hmm. and, and Spear and Carl Misch implants. And so you kind of go, so I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to bring in a young star that's already been down that road, has already started their journey to excellence and is reading more books and listening to podcasts and watching webinars more than any young dentist I've ever met in my life. So um, that, that's been a, I know we're going to talk about that, Kurt, but that's been an amazing transition and transformation for me professionally and personally. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that was my next question is just, you know, when you bring somebody in, you're training them on the culture. You know, he obviously, you know, the purchaser of any practice has to make it their own. But transferring that core values, you know, what you've worked so hard, what was that like for you? Um, what's interesting is Dr. Hatcher and his wife, Dr. Steve Hatcher, Dr. Sonia Isharani, she's a pediatric dentist. They bought the practice September 15th. 2017. Uh, we had Frank Brown with Watson Brown out of Dallas do the transition. Frank's an attorney for Masters in Tax. Unbelievable talent. Win, win, or no deal. Great right. way to do business. And it's funny, Dr. Hatcher's past president of Dental Society, so am I. He's a very strong personality, tremendous talent. And at Dental Society, uh, people will come up to me and kind of look around and go, how's it going? And I'm like, really well. <laughs> No, how's it going? I'm like, mm-hmm. really well. And then Steve afterwards came up to me and said, you know how many people came up to me and went, how's it going? I'm like, a bunch of turkeys. Right. Uh, right up front, we just said, every it's win, win, or no deal. You know, we're never, ever going to criticize each other in front of a patient, in front of a teammate. That is sacred, private, one-on-one conversation. He right up front said he wanted me to mentor him and coach him. What's interesting, I taught Dr. Hatcher and Dr. Isharani when they were dental students at UNC in 1999. Mm-hmm. First year dental students had to come, had to go interview a private practitioner and write a paper on them. And Dr. Hatcher came to Greensboro and wrote a paper on me. Which, and 
he said, I took him out to a nice dinner, which I had no memory of, but I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Right. Um, and uh, I remember seeing when he was back at the Dental Society for the first time he'd been in the Army, and I was like, I remember you. I wish I'd known you were coming back to town. He'd already bought Dr. Grubb's practice. I said, I would have brought you in. And uh, the fact that he decided to merge his practice with ours has just been joyful. So for the past five years, because of the seminar world, I've, I've seen patients about 12 days a month for the past five years. And now I'm seeing patients Monday through Wednesday, four weeks out of, out of a month. That's back to my 12 days still. Yeah. So when he's on vacation, I'll, I'll work more. When I'm gone, he's covering for me. And it's just been a riot. The talent level that he brought in, the level of training. Uh, we do a morning huddle every day, which is imperative. And then we debrief at the end of every day. And that's been amazing. And Kurt, we do a full three hours every week of no patience. Training time, restocking time, lab work. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, that's awesome. What day of the week are you doing that, the three hours? Every Tuesday afternoon is is reserved for training time, continuing education, webinars, podcasts. Uh, I've got a picture in my seminar. I was walking down the hall. The four hygienists are seated down to the hygiene wing of the practice, huddled up talking about things. And I was like, that's really cool because right. I know Dr. Hatcher didn't ask him to do that. And I certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. Their department said, we need some time to talk and figure some things out. And I was like, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just, it's been a, a, a joyful ride and a whole lot of fun when you got a lot of people that love you and care for you and about you. And you hire great consultants and you go to great CE and you buy the finest equipment, whether you're a Patterson or Shine or Benco guy, push your reps to show you what's cutting edge. Right. Get a Serac and you want to throw your hands up, you look at an E4D, that cut of grand, can't wait for that. Yeah, you can, that's 500 bucks a day. Right. Oh, it's, it's a it's a couple buckle pits, it's a Panorex and a whitening, it's not real money. Mm -hmm. You just, no one wants to pay that, but the liberation and the reinvention when you invest in this technology, it's staggering. Yeah, absolutely. And so it isn't so much the dollar for dollar return. I mean, it's the fact that you're excited. You say that same thing about CE, you know, you're going to learn a lot. You'll be surrounded by great mentors, but you come back and the fire is lit. I mean, you keep that fire large and, 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 and raging for this profession, for getting better and all that kind of stuff. So I think a steady diet of what you're talking about is critically important. Now, I'm going to ask you one last question too, because I know you've got a lot to give. You've got a lot of roads ahead of you on the education world. And if you're looking for a great speaker and you haven't had Mark, you got to get him. He's phenomenal. What other pieces of advice as you're looking for a competitive or distinct advantage of listening, what other advice would you give a young dentist or even a mature dentist watching this, uh, looking at the road ahead? Oh boy. You know, I think we, we've hit on so many of them. The most fundamental thing is a picture on every patient, every procedure before, during, and after. Set a continuing education goal and set it high. 100 hours a year of CE, does that sound like a lot? If you go to Panky, and Coy, Spear, that's, you can get 20% of your CE right there mm -hmm. just in that amount of time. Um, I absolutely think you look outside of dentistry for your inspiration, outside of dentistry for me, for the books that I've mentioned. Uh, Tom Peters was my hero back in the late 80s. He wrote the book In Search of Excellence, A Passion for Excellence, right. and a, at my dental practice, actually, Thriving on Chaos. And, uh, and that's just been a tremendous thing. Uh, I think also recognizing that we're never done. You know, the journey is continuous. Mm -hmm. A classmate of mine occurred at one of my seminars getting right up in my face and said, Mark, I'm doing it just the way they taught me in dental school. And I thought, what a loser. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything the way they taught me in dental school. The principles of quality don't change, but the materials, the technology, the whole presentation, everything, it keeps getting better and better, so why would you brag you're doing it old school? That doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Talked about technologies. We have eight operatories currently. We have eight isolites. I'm still embarrassed the number of people that don't have an isolite, the isolation system. Five-in-one bite block, tongue retractor, cheek retractor suction, LED right. light. 
cuts of time takes the procedure 30 to 50 percent. Yep. Now pieces cost dollars and two bucks a patient. Yeah. Say to me, Dr. Mark, how do you charge the patient for the two dollars? I'm like, why do you care? Mm -hmm. An extra hour a day. Right. Made you another thousand dollars a day minimum. Right. At the end of the year, you just got a free CERAC or E4D or. Just, it's amazing to me. Yeah. And so being a continuous student and being humble, because mm -hmm. again, you honor me with your nice words, Kurt. I, I stand on the shoulder of giants very much so, and that a few demented men and women stop in my seminars and email and do these things. I'm very, very humbled by that. Yeah. So, it's so it is. It truly is a privilege. But and then I consider our relationship a privilege and an honor, buddy. I really appreciate this. And you and I are going to cover other subjects. Um, and I'm just crazy grateful for your time today. Now, if people want to get a hold of you, Mark, how can they get a hold of you directly to ask you any questions? Anyone who wants to email me, the email is smile s m i l e at tarheel t a r h e e l smile at tarheeldentist.com. You can go on my speaking website, drmarkspeaks.com, or you can call or text me on my cell phone, 336-456-6728. My wife will shoot me for giving that out, but three, three, <laughs> six, seven. bring it on, buddy. Again, the Linda Miles, Kathy Jamisons, Naomi Rhodes, Kurt Barents of the world put so much into me, so much love and trust and affection and attention. The least I can do is say, let me give it back in some fashion to anybody that needs it. And, uh, and part of my message back, for those of you who choose to reach out to me personally, then you will owe me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Pay it forward. Be doing this for a young dentist someday. Amen, brother. Given to United Way, given to your church or synagogue or mosque, donating to your dental school in Dr. Mark's honor. That would be my gift if someone wants some private time with me. It's like you got it, but you got to pay it forward. You got to give a helping hand to someone else, and, um, and keep listening to Kurt because you can't go wrong with him. He's a madman, but he's one of the rising super duper stars of dentistry. I'm so honored what you're doing, Kurt, and that you consider me worthy of your webinars. I consider you a dear friend. Hey. So from one well, national into another. Yeah, well, that's very kind of you. And it's don't listen to me. Listen to these people. These people have all the wisdom. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm going to stay curious. And I'm, uh, I'm so grateful, buddy. And you've got so many great things. If you, again, if you haven't seen Dr. Mark Kyman speak, you got to see it. Um, you know, we've been pretty calm today, but when he gets in a seminar setting, I mean, your hair will be on fire. So my friend, thank you so much. Um, if you're watching today, please type in some great questions for Dr. Mark Hyman. He will give you an incredibly thoughtful response. And uh, like I said, we just want you to get the most out of this. And so Mark, stay on for just a second. I want to chat with you. But uh, if, you're, if you're watching, keep watching. We are, we are so grateful. Um, the response has just been tremendous. And until we see you next time, keep watching Best Practices Show. Peace out.